flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> All right. Uh, She's not a real one. I gotta go over the. Uh, oh. I thought, I thought it was oh cool. no, I had to turn it off. Um, minutes for minutes approval. Uh, looking at the minutes for December 11th. Are there any changes or corrections? Mm, no, I don't find it. No. December 11th. I make a motion wait, wait, just wait, 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 to have a change. How we doing? Good. You got any changes on December 11th meeting? Minutes? Um, there was a, a little, oh, December, no. No, okay. Okay. I make a motion that the December 11th uh, minutes be uh, accepted. I'll make a motion. All in favor? Aye. Oh, Aye. Okay. I'll second. No, no, he's, he's second, Lenny seconds. Okay. Uh, minutes of uh, January 8th, 8th meeting, 2018. Uh, motion. Changes or corrections? Um, well, oh. I'm not sure if if it's a correction or not, but um, oh, uh, but there was a, rep a repeat of something I said. Maybe I said it twice. I don't know. <laughs> okay, I guess it's okay. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, January 8th, so meetings are, minutes are complete. And 30 minutes is for a special meeting we had for January 22nd. Uh, this is a special joint meeting with the uh, Conservation Board and the Zoning Board. Uh, are there any changes or corrections? Does anybody have any changes or corrections? Get a motion? I'll make a motion. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All the minutes are passed unanimously. Uh, I'm going to just take one out of order here. I know there's a, there's a Essex screen is first, but wants to, is there anybody here for 22 Hudson River Lane? You? Could you step up here, please? And identify yourself at the microphone. At the microphone, please. sure. Christopher Schmidt with Neve Group. With who? A new group. Oh, you're, you're the pool company. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I went through this application. What I'm going to do is I'm going to refer this to the Conservation Board. Okay. Okay. Because I know you do you have a meeting with them tomorrow night or something? Yeah, we'll have a walkthrough in the morning and then we have a meeting tomorrow night. Yeah, because uh, what you're trying to do here is put an in-the-ground pool in, uh, I mean, your, your point is trying to put an in-the-ground pool in uh, Hudson uh, River Lane, which you know is a flood zone. And... Um, it's a wetlands also, so you're not going to need a wetlands permit. Correct. Okay, so you're going to, I think you deal with them first. When you get approved by them first, then you can come back to us and we'll reschedule you to go to review this. Okay. Okay? All right. Thank Thanks. you very much. I didn't want to hold you up for the whole meeting. I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, next one is uh, continuation of um, Essex Green. I just wanted to mention that. <coughs> oh. That he's missing. Um, uh, I'm going to go. uh, One second before you leave. Sure. One of the board members just wants to give uh, you some of the things you're missing. When, when, if, when you come back, you know, assu assuming you get a wetlands per permit, mm -hmm. uh, you, you're missing the application for this uh, uh, variance, and also you need your deed and a certificate of occupancy. So you, you, need, you need those th things, which were not in, in this application. Okay. Yeah, okay. okay. Thank you. They, they'll give you a list downstairs in the building yeah. department. She'll give you a list of what you need. Okay, great. Uh, since last uh, meeting, I got a letter, received a letter from um, Kenneth Levine, 103 Healy Road. Uh, he's against the uh, project. He says it's uh, will impede his view shed and uh, does not meet required minimum setbacks. Uh, received information from... Um, 50, 60 pages, I guess. So Mr. Martino, you here? Okay. Uh, from Martino and Weiss, correct? Okay. I guess you're the attorney for Mr. Healy? Yes, correct. No, uh, Mr. Meyer. I'm, for, I'm sorry? Meyer family. Meyer family. Okay. Okay. And <clears throat> to rebut the information you put in, we got information from Mr. Richmond. So we got enough information. Uh, what I'd like to do 
It's a little complicated, this one. You know that, and I know that, Mr. Richmond. So I'd like to break it down a little bit in pieces, okay? Let's start first about what we need and go from there. Uh, in your letter, uh, you know, you, um, you argue a little bit about what Mr. Mort uh, Martino presented. But uh, on the bottom of the first page, it said, respectfully, he said, it's unfortunate that the Myers gamemanship has repeatedly interfered with the applicant's ability to process his application. After the applicant duly appeared, uh, appealed to town code enforcement officer, initial denial letter for the project uh, to your board in August of 2017, the CEO, which would be the code enforcement officer, subsequently asked she issued an unprecedented new denial letter for the application two months later in significant part in response to opposition from the Myers. Uh, the letter was confusing from the, building, from the building inspector. I agree with you. His letter was confusing. I'd like to just go to his letter. So there's a lot of points in there what we're going to need. That would be your first uh, submission under Exhibit um, A. That would be the first book. We have a book from um, November 3rd from Mr. Oh. Richmond's submission November 3rd. Do you have it? No, I, did, I took it out to read it and I didn't. Does it here? Uh, uh, I don't know. Is that it? Oh, in, in, in this? I don't know. Is that November 3rd? No, that's, that's, the, that's in November. Can I just look on with you? Oh, it's in oh, November 3rd. That's the one you need. Oh, oh okay. Go to Exhibit okay. A. All right. Okay. Uh, sure. This is from uh, October 25th from uh, Building Inspector, our Code Enforcement Officer, uh, Greg Warner. And yes. he said, uh, he tells us what's included in it, but he says, the applicant proposes a new single family dwelling on a lot that is divided by the town of Phillipstown slash village of Nelsonville municipal boundary lines. Mm -hmm. By operation of law, the portion of the lot located within the village of Nelsonville cannot be counted towards meeting the town's bulk requirements. Now, I guess what my question would be to our attorney. It, us determining it, determining and looking at this, are we looking at this as a half acre in Phillipstown or the whole piece? Or could we combine both pieces? How do we determine it? Well, uh, we're, we're in accordance with the letter from the, the code enforcement officer. Um, the, the, the first question is is this a pre-existing non-conforming lot or not which is a question of interpretation based upon the language that was in the zoning code uh, back in 1957 um, if it's a pre-existing non-conforming lot uh, in accordance with the letter from the code enforcement officer uh, the applicant would not need a, an area variance for lot area. Um, so th that's a question of uh, I interpretation. Uh, with respect to the, uh, and I think to answer your question, um, uh, regardless of whether they need a variance for lot area, uh, they do need area variances to construct uh, this house for, um, in terms of a front yard setback, uh, with respect to a rear yard setback, and it's set forth in the letter. Uh, if it is a pre-existing non-conforming lot, uh, they do not need a variance for a rear yard setback. Uh, if it's not a pre-existing non-conforming lot, they do need a couple of variances for a rear yard setback. And they also need um, a, a small variance for impervious surface coverage. They do not need an area variance uh, with respect to road frontage, according to the code enforcement officer. Right. And I, I see, so I read in his letter on the second page, he says, under the circumstances, the information submitted, I'm going to, because we started this, he had to approve it. Sorry? When we started this, yes, the building inspector said it was a non you know, a legal non conforming he Implicitly, then he, in his first letter. Some information and changed, and changed the opinion. <laughs> but under the circumstances, the information submitted on this application is insufficient for the town building inspector to make a determination as to whether the subject property is or is not 
a legal nonconforming lot. He's got the same information we have. Well, but I, and I think that's that's an apt point. First of all, if I could answer the first question, I think you addressed to Mr. Rod. Um, I think you know, in terms of the bulk requirements, it's figuring out the bulk requirements. The code enforcement officer is right that technically you consider just a land that's in the town. So, for example, with respect to frontage, um, if you determine that the, this was not a legal nonconforming lot, technically this lot doesn't have any frontage in the town. But again, all the case law, and we've cited it in all our letters talks about that zoning boards are supposed to consider not be guided by technical analysis, but supposed to be guided by the totality of the relevant circumstances. That's a phrase you find repeatedly throughout the case law. And I think what that means here is that you need to consider, you can't put blinders on to the fact that reality is there is frontage on the property that this house would be located on, although it's in the village. So although, yes, technically it's 100% frontage variance because there is no frontage in the town, but that's because the municipal boundary bisects the property. So the frontage would be in, in the village. And again, I think your board, in considering how the totality of the relevant circumstances, how this lot would be experienced by the public and uh, all other uh, affected members of the public, um, would, I think, should recognize, would have to recognize in the totality of relevant circumstances that the lot has frontage and so forth. Um, you point to the fact that you say, well, we have essentially the same information that the code enforcement officer says. And I, I would just put to the previous line of that code enforcement letter that you're talking about where he said the 1957 code did not expressly state that taking must be by eminent domain. And as the property owner points out, any ambiguity in the zoning code must be construed in the light most favorable to the property owner. <coughs> So again, I think at best, you know, again, I think it's clear that taking doesn't have that particular meaning here and that to read into that, to add that gloss onto it is um, prohibited by a variety of court, court of appeals case law that I'd be happy to walk the board through again. It's in all our submissions. We got enough to go through. So Understood. Go ahead. But again, I think, you know, so at best, I think, you know, the project components, including the Myers, the best they can, th is there's an ambiguity. And the law is clear, as I'm sure Mr. Rod could advise you, that where there's an ambiguity in that circumstance, the law requires that you read it in favor of the property owner, the private property owner, in favor of its free exercise of rights. Okay. So I think if your board finds that there is an ambiguity, which I think, again, I don't, I don't think there is an ambiguity, but if you found that there was an ambiguity, it could be construed either way, then I think you would have to find that this is a legal nonconforming lot. I do want to point out that even if you do find it's a legal nonconforming lot, I would ask your board to go further and to grant us all the variances as if it weren't a legal nonconforming lot. Because I think you can clearly in the totality of circumstances do that. This would just be another single family home like any other family home. And I, you know, when you're done answering all your questions, I'd like Susan to walk you through, you know, what she's proposing to do, some of her other projects, because I think you're already some of your board members are already familiar with, but I think it's it's good. It will work seamlessly with the neighborhood, and I think that's something your board needs to take into account as well. Okay. I just want to get you on the legal aspect. Sure. Today. I'm a little confused on some Thank of you. it. You know. uh, okay. Now, I guess what I'm in looking at this and reading this, what I'm trying, I guess what the time is that we have to look at, first thing we would have to look at, was it taken or um, <coughs> is it used for public use? Well, and I think, you know, would as we've shown... Because that would determine whether it's a legal or not uh, legal conforming or non-legal conforming lot. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's an an there's an ambiguity uh, in the language of the 1957 code uh, that says, and I'm paraphrasing, if property is uh, taken for uh, a, a a public uh, use, uh, that will. Uh, not be counted uh, against or used against um, the lot size, uh, the minimum lot size. Okay. And if I could just add in, sure. um, again, with that, you know, I think, I don't think anyone here contests that the property was acquired by Village of Cold Spring for the purposes of connecting to the aqueduct and that that's a public purpose. I'm sorry, Ms. How much, how much acreage was taken um, by the Village of Cold Spring? I believe it was approximately an acre. An acre. Uh, well, what, 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 let's break this down, okay? I'd like to start with one point. If I can just address, yes. One, one point. Yes, let's Mr. Let's start D. with one point. I think we should solve the issue first if this was taken 
or for, you know by eminent domain or for public use. That's what I'd like to do because going for, that would make a difference on what kind of variances you would need. Sure, I don't think there's any debate that the property that Cold Spring obtained this property for the purposes of a public use. I think the issue is. Mr. Myers has raised, he said that the word taken can only mean eminent domain, even though the word eminent domain doesn't appear in the 1957 code. Again, as we pointed out, taken is just a past participle of to acquire, such as people commonly say when they acquire property, I took title to my house. When did, you know, I can ask anyone on this board, when did you take title to your house? And anyone without batting an eye would say, well, it wasn't eminent domain, but I took title by, you know, in 2000. Is there a difference between taken and given? I mean, they keep drawing out the word taken, but I don't, it wasn't taken. I don't quite get it yet. It, that's the ambiguity. I mean, no, I don't believe in, in the record that uh, we, we have evidence of the circumstances of how the village of Cold Spring the turn, uh, acquired or took this property uh, 51, more than 50 years ago. Um, so there's an ambiguity in the language of the, the code. It does not use, the, Mr. Richmond is correct, the code does not um, employ the term eminent domain um, in the 1957 code. So there, there's, there's an ambiguity. And it's up to the, the board uh, to, to interpret that. Um, I just want to mention that um, Currently, when land is um, needed for pipelines, um, a lot of times, uh, well, first of all, they can take it by an eminent domain if they want to. Mm -hmm. However, a lot of times they negotiate with the landowner, so it's not, ta and they make an agreement with the landowner, so it's not taken by eminent domain, it's taken <coughs> by an agreement between the company and the landowner, and we don't know that that didn't happen here. Let me ask you a question. Uh, I read some of Mr. Uh, uh, Martino's uh, memorandum of law and taking analyzed. Mm -hmm. And one thing he says is the village of Cold Spring clearly lays out that it is a typical acquisition by a municipality without any force or any type of legal proceedings or the use of the prescribed statutory process for eminent domain. It was, in fact, an arm's length transaction between two willing parties. This important fact is reinforced by the fact that the sellers, Ralph and uh, Cyril O'Neill, sold over a dozen parcels of their land holdings immediately surrounding the subject parcel between 1965 and 1967, indicating that this was not an anomaly. The sellers were selling all their properties and that the transaction with the village of Cold Spring was just another transaction. Uh, is that correct, that statement? Well, th th now, there are, I think there are a variety of errors. I mean, I'd start out first the, uh, in that sentence that you read where it talked about four statutory proceedings, et cetera. That's all a gloss that the Myers are seeking to add on to the 1957 code. And again, as we've pointed out repeatedly throughout this process, the Court of Appeals has repeatedly said that when you, new language, quote, and I'm quoting from the Chemical Specialties Manufacturers versus Jorling, this is the Court of Appeals, new language cannot be imported into a statute to give it a meaning not otherwise found. And again, as the court said, again, um, you cannot, quote, amend a statute by inserting words that are not there. So I think to start, when you add words like force, eminent domain, statutory proceedings, I understand that's a gloss that they think is helpful to their argument, but it's not in a 1957 code. I think you have to, again, as we pointed out, look at the plain language of the code. Um, the plain language of the code is taken. I think that just means took title, acquired. And it's, again, as we have pointed out, Cold Spring, clearly I think the circumstances, and we have provided evidence of this, that the Board of Trustees in approving the acquisition specifically stated that such land was vital and important link to the connection to the proposed New York City water supply. Um, and um, I don't know about all the other sales that went on about their property, but I think it's clear, as Mrs. Clare pointed out, that there is commonly a situation where a municipality or a governmental entity may want to acquire property, and it may not, at the end of the day, be through whatever they say, force or statutory proceedings, or um, that it may be you know, through some other um, kind of exercise of governmental authority, which is what happened here. 
Let me ask you another thing, Mr. Sure. Martino's uh, work. He says, in addition, in October 25th, 20, uh, October 27th denial letter of Greg Warner, is our code enforcement officer, he agrees with our analysis and that the word taken in land use parlance is generally understood to mean a taking by eminent domain or at least an involuntary extraction. And if this definition is accepted, then the property is not a legal nonconforming lot and an area variance is needed. Uh, he goes on to say that the 1957 code did not expressly state that the taking must be by eminent domain and that there could be an ambiguity in the language. As we have stated above, uh, there could be no ambiguity here. Uh, he says that there's no ambiguity. That's not in his letter. Uh, Are you reading from the Myers? No, I'm reading from, Myers I'm from Mr. Mart Martino's. Yeah. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is, uh, well, I, think I guess it's, what I'm trying to say is, I'd like to settle this first with sure. the board, okay? I mean, whether this is taken or whether this was for public use. So I'd like to give Mr. Martino a chance to speak on that. On sure. the, just the one issue. I'm talking about taken and public use. Right, before we Thank you. Else, um, I just wanted to make note, you, you asked the question about what happened in 19, between 1965 and 67 when the O'Neills was selling property. That's a fact that's in the land records of, of, of the town here. So council didn't answer the question, but in fact that's what happened. O'Neill sold their property uh, for over the course of num a number of years to various uh, uh, entities, including the, uh, the, the town of Cold Spring. Um, the, the point of the, ta the point, the, I think the, the underlying idea about a taking it, and the exception in the zoning, in the zoning code is, is that when a property owner is, has property involuntarily taken from them, there's an exception to the zoning code that allows them some of accommodation so they can still use their property because the property was involuntarily taken. So they're, some, they're allowed some accommodation to, to, for the use of their property, wh the way it's configured after, this, after, the, uh, after the, the, the property was involuntarily taken. That's different when you have um, arm's length transactions between uh, municipality and, 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 a, and a property owner. If it was the definition by, as, 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 of taking was, was to be twisted, and every, every time a municipality takes property is for a public use. But that's not, does, that doesn't make it um, uh, tantamount to a taking, an involuntarily uh, eminent domain procedure, that's statutory procedure. That was not done in this case. It was not taken. It was, it was, it was an arm's length transaction between two, um, two entities, one of which happened to, happens to be a municipality. The definition, as in the code, tracks the, the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment. There's not one case that I could find that, that, finds that, 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 that uh, contradicts that definition of what of what a taking is. It's an involuntarily, involuntary acquisition, uh, taking of property from a, by a municipality through the statutory process, which was not done in this case. So that's the short answer to that question. And, the, and the, I'm not going to give you the case law because the case law is, 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 is endless in right. terms of... Uh, no, I, that, I, I could see that. I, I'm just trying to... I want, I want to handle this one point at a time. Got okay, it. Because it is, there's a lot of Certainly. parts sure. here. Okay. Uh, so I guess, thank you. That'd be, that'd be good. So legally... Mr. Rod, what's your opinion? Well, it's a matter of uh, interpretation for the board. That's your uh, uh, decision. Um, but you know, my recommendation would be, you know, that's obviously one issue that the board is going to have to deal with, as to whether this is a pre-existing non-conforming lot uh, or not. Uh, and then proceed to the various uh, area variances. And I would consider them in the context of it either is a pre-existing non-conforming lot or not. Okay. Well, I guess the issue with the board, the first point would be is uh, to make a decision on whether this was taken or the ambiguity in the law is for public purpose. Anybody have any more questions or information they want to need for that? Or? Well, I, I would... My recommendation would be to complete the public hearing. Um, there's a lot of materials uh, to... Yeah, I understand that, but how, how are we going to go forward? Because it makes a difference on how many variances he needs. I, w I would hear the applicant out on each and every variance. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's just puts me in confusing, because I'll tell you why, you know, there's probably four or five how many variances would you need? Three, three or four? If you agree it's a non-conforming lie. See, that's the point. If we agree it's a non-conforming lie, I agree with you 100%. So the only way we can agree, because the building inspector 
doesn't know. So the only way that we can do it, it would be to make a decision on whether the land was taken or not taken. That would make a difference on how many variances you need. Is that correct or not? Yeah, we would need five if it's not. But again, Mr. Chair, I would ask your board to, you know, we do need five. We would need five lots if your board did not agree with us that there's an ambiguity in the code. Otherwise, uh, it would be four. Two. I'm sorry? We would two. need, if, if you agreed with us that it's a legal nonconforming lot, because of the ambiguity in the code, we would need a front yard setback variance okay. and an impervious surface, surface variance. So you don't need two? Impervious. Just those two. If you did not agree with us, we would also need lot area, rear yard setback, and road frontage. And road furnish. Right. Well, but it's yard setback. The, the letter from the code enforcement officer indicates that you do not need a road frontage variance. That's correct. If we don't, you, you don't need a road frontage variance. I'll read, it. I'll read the paragraph for you. Uh, it says the applicants, this is from the Greg Warner. This is your exhibit A uh, on from your November 3rd. Uh, from his letter, it says at the last page, it says the applicant's property is accessed via a driveway off a private road, Douglas Lane, under Town Code Chapter 112. When property is, is accessed by a right of way or easement, <clears throat> as opposed to a public road or roadway on a filed map in an approved subdivision, it is necessary to obtain an open development area permit from the building inspector or the planning board before a building permit may be issued. However, it is not necessary to seek a variance from the ZBA in regards to the access of a private road. I guess what I'm trying to say is- Public road. Public, public, mm -hmm. public road. So which building inspector do you have to get this open development from? Do you know? Is it? Well, well yeah, they, they don't need, just to be clear, the applicant does not need a variance from this board for road frontage that that's right. it you, you need that is not dependent on whether it's a pre-existing non-conforming lot or not there was no road frontage requirement in 1957 so they they don't need that okay. my, my suggestion is um to to hear the applicant uh, because the the application does speak in the alternative. Their position is this is a pre-existing non-conforming lot and they don't need a variance for lot area. However, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, um, to the extent the board would find that it's not a pre-existing non-conforming lot, one of the um, items of relief that they're seeking for, if the board would find that, was an area variance, a lot area variance, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, so if we did not agree my with recommendation is, is make your presentation and we'll hear the other side in terms of uh, entitlement to, let's say it is not a pre-existing non-conforming lot. You're still seeking, I'm just throwing that out as a hypothetical, mm -hmm. understanding that the board has not ruled one way or the other. You, you, your application materials still makes the case for a variance for lot area. Mm -hmm still uh, makes an application for a front yard setback, which you will need whether it's a pre-existing non-conforming lot or not. Uh, still making an application for impervious surface coverage. And to the extent it's not a pre-existing non-conforming lot, you're seeking uh, a rear yard setback. Yes. So. And again, I would ask the board to grant those, even if it concurs with us that this is a pre-existing lot, it should still opine that those variances should be granted because, again, under the totality of the relevant circumstances, ultimately this is a house like any other. So, for example, with respect to the, um, let's take the front yard setback. Again, the front yard setback is, again, essentially a technicality. The uh, code enforcement officer determined our front yard and measured it from the municipal line that uh, cuts through the uh, property line. Um, but if, in fact, 
the um, you know if you look at your code, the code talks about the front the uh, front yard being measured from either the road or the middle of the road. So we would think that again, you would have to measure it from there either way. But again, the reality is that there is property in the village uh, on, that effectively gives this uh, sets the house back 70 feet back from the road. So again, while yes, it may be the code on the code enforcement officers that might be 100 percent variance. But again, as the case law says, you have to look at the totality, the relevant circumstances. How is this going to be in the real purpose? Ultimately, getting down to the balancing of the benefit to the applicant versus the harm to the community. And I would submit the harm to the community from that variance is de minimis. And while the uh, benefit of the uh, variances to the applicant are great, similar with lot area. Um, I know, for example, that the, the Myers have, you know, in their most recent submission, have asked your board just to look at the village portion of the problem, just 0.55, and based on that have come out with an assertion that, well, that's, you know, one of, the, they said the smallest, makes that the smallest lot in the area. It ignores the fact that there is um, an additional 0.88 acres in the village, and that in the reality, as the public would experience the totality of the relevant circumstances, it's a 1.4 acre lot, um, and it, as you, if you look at even the analysis that the Myers submitted, 18 or 67 percent of the lots that they show um, contain two acres or less. All the lots that they analyzed have an average lot of 2.227 acres. So that places our lot right in the middle of the analysis. On which side of the line, at Phillipstown or the Nelson Belt, or is this totally the amount you keep keep citing here? Well, I think so. When you're dealing with the bulk requirement that's just within your jurisdiction. Technically, as the code enforcement officer is, that's measured just by the 0.55 acres that's in the town. What I'm saying is the case law requires the board to consider the totality of the relevant what circumstances. The other lots in the area. Yes. Phillips Town are a certain acreage, or the ones in Nelsonville are different acreage? Yes. Which ones are you Glenn, talking about? Glenn, do you want to speak to that? I'm 0.2 acres Glenn. on average. He gave us a map. Uh, I yeah. still not sure. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Sure. Glenn and Watson. The... the what was analyzed, there were some in the village and some in just the town. Uh, I d in looking at the maps, I, I noticed that most of the uh, smaller lots were in Nelsonville. Um, oh. However, however, um, there were lots in Phillipstown that were far less than 10 acres. I saw three acres, five acres. Um, that's correct. Yeah. So I, th correct. He, I think he's talking about the Nelsonville uh, lots when he's talking about the well, percentages 24, 24 that he. 24 lots was in both places. Oh, we, no, it was a combination. The 24 lots that were analyzed were, were somewhere in just oh, okay. in the town and somewhere in Nelsonville. Okay. Yep. And I th overall, I think both the surrounding community in the village and the town needs to be factored in again in the totality of the circumstances because that's the surrounding community. Uh, can you do us a favor when you're talking about property in Nelsonville, can you tell us that before you, you go on about it because it's confusing otherwise? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Or are you, um, I mean, can, you know, again, I'm happy to walk through all the variances if you want me to go through them. Um, well, I think we, we think we know what variance. <laughs> What variances you need? I guess, way on the advice of attorney, I guess we would be if we're going to give it. We're going to we have to consider all variances, which would be the five variances. Okay, great. Four. No, all right. You know, I mean, we you know that would probably be the safest way to do it. You know, because otherwise we're going to have to make a decision. We're going to make a lot of decisions here. We're make a lot of was this taken? Was this not taken? You know, I mean, uh, you know, here again, the building inspector doesn't doesn't know whether it's. Uh, you know, it's uh, conforming and non-conforming. So there's a lot of things that have to be right. uh, taken here by the board. All right, so I think the next thing to consider is, um, I know the Myers have suggested this would be the largest house in the area, which again, I think is a misrepresentation, which we pointed out in our February submission, the one that we handed up uh, last week. I think it appears to misleadingly rely on livable area that's posted on the county image made data, um, which tends to overstate square footage to the building, understate square footage of buildings, undercounts things, for example, such as finished basements and garages. For example, the Myers, the footprint of their property, as we showed in the survey, is approximately 4,000 feet. So I think it doesn't actually represent, if you just base it on the livable area, they're showing, based on that county, doesn't show the actual size and massing effect. I think in re the reality is this house 
would be much more in, would be in conformity with the prevailing community character. I'd like to have Susan Green, if you. Uh, before I do that, before sure. I do that, I want to. I'll, I'll, I'll arrange the schedule. Okay, before I do that, I want to have Mr. Martino speak. So I want you to give me all your... Uh, well, part of our reasons. argument um, is, um, you know, the effect that this house would have, again, because I think that's ultimately what it comes down to. Okay. What's the effect of the granting these variances, how it would have on the community? Does the benefit of granting them to the applicant outweigh the detriment to any alleged by the community? I think it would be important to hear from Ms. Green at this point, who can explain the character of the house she would be building and how it would fit into no, the I, I, I'm gonna, you know, give her time to talk. Not a problem. I just want to do it. I want to do it one way. I'm looking for the legalese first. Okay, that's what I'm trying to. That's what I'm talking to turn you. So at this point in time, I'd like to ask Mr. Martino. Sure. Okay, to uh, speak. Uh, I know he's in opposition, but give me your your points why uh, you're in opposition. Would you like me to address the the question of the taking uh, at this point? Well, or? Or, or, I think it pretty much addressed the take, and you know, well, I, I don't know what your, what the board is well, considering well, in terms of well, we're looking, uh, how we're, it's, now we're, we're, we're going to have to consider five variances. Well, okay. I was I was going to suggest, Judge, uh, uh, Mr. D, that at some point you have to make a ruling as to whether it was a taking or not. I agree, with uh, and we have to have a record of this so for for whatever purposes we need. Going I agree. Forward. With, no, I'm, I'm, I asked the attorney again. Do yeah, we yeah, make but that there, There's no now? obligation. I mean, you're correct. I mean, they're going to have to make it. The board's going to have to make that interpretation, but they don't have to do that in midstream in the middle of a public hearing. I, no, I, 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 however you however you yeah. uh, wanted to, well, to address at the point it. Point in time, I want to. I'm going to ask for a closed session to go downstairs to talk to the attorney because I have a lot of confusing questions here. Okay, yeah, so we'll take about five Second. or ten minutes. I make a motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Uh, all right, we're back in uh, back in session. I apologize for the length of. Huh? Make a motion to come out of closed session. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, I think I apologize for that. There are some legal questions here that I, I want to answer before we proceed. I guess uh, we were, Mrs. Uh, you were going to make a presentation on your. Uh, a word or two? Sure. You're, step up to the microphone if you can. Okay. Um, Identify yourself. Susan Green, the architect of the uh, house. I okay. uh, actually don't think of myself as a uh, spec builder. I, I do houses in, in Cold Spring sometimes for particular clients, and then when I'm between houses and I'm itching to work, I sometimes take a uh, bank loan and build a house on my own and then f try to find a buyer for it. So my houses um, all resemble barns. And that's because my first desire in, in building a house is to make a house that fits in. I love Phillipstown. I love the rural quality. I love the old houses. Uh, I started by making houses that look old. But old houses have small windows. They have low ceilings. They can look wonderful from the outside and authentic from the outside, but they can be very dark and dreary inside. So then I started building houses that look like barns. And the good thing about that is you can have a, a barn on the outside that looks completely authentic, and yet on the inside you can still have high ceilings and big windows and um, a pleasant place to live. So uh, the only thing I can say that is that some sites really do not suit barns. But this particular site really does. It's a big open field with a stone wall. And it's just the kind of place where a farmer would have put his barn in the first place. Um, I'll just say what. These are the property from looking up from yeah. the top of the hill, looking down. Is that what it is? Uh, okay. This, this is mm -hmm. standing where the house will be. And um, this one's looking north. So Montres is behind. These trees. Uh, this is Mop, this will be Moffat Road here. This Moffat. is the Nelsonville house that you can see. Okay. This is standing in the same spot and looking towards the Myers house, uh, which is here. The back of the Myers house <coughs> is here. It's a, it's about it's longer than a football field away from my house, uh, 360 or something like that. This is the back of their house. The front of their house faces the river. No, you got that back. Well, that's not right, Susan. That's the front of their house. You drive up to the front of their house. Oh, okay. But the view is the other way, so that's why I think of it as the front. Okay. Sorry. Mr. Kabula, the microphone. Are you finished? Or? Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll just say also that um, 
apparently it was spoken about, uh, about me uh, last time that I um, was fined in a project in, um, on Jay Cox Road. And that's true. It was very early. It was in the mid-90s. It was about my second house. Um, I paid my fine. I never did it again. It never happened again. It was one time <coughs> only. Okay. What was the fine for? Uh, for cutting, cutting trees, trees on a slope. You build two houses. You build two houses, I guess, right? What, I built two houses. The first one, there was no problem at all. Right. It, it was actually misreported in the newspaper. Uh, it was the second house that I cut some trees cut in the, the trees, back. Right. You paid for that. I paid for it, and we planted trees. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now, who would like to speak? Mr. You're the mayor, right, Mr.? I am. Yes. Come up, please. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Bill O'Neill. I am the mayor of Nelsonville. And first of all, let me compliment you and the board. Uh, having served on such a board is a thankless job, but you folks have worked very hard and have done very well. And on behalf of the community, I want to say thank you. Um, as you may recall, the original application for this property uh, was the bulk of the building would have been in, within the village of, ne of, ne of Nelsonville. Now, our zoning up there is, sorry? Yeah, it, but it did shift. The second application, which Don't came to- the whole thing in Nelsonville? Uh, well, you can't, because our zoning would prohibit it, which is precisely the point that we have mountain residential zoning there, which is two-acre zoning. Uh, I believe that the, uh, had the application gone through the, the, the village of, of Nelsonville, uh, based on our history, we, we would have turned it down. Now, I'm sympathetic to the applicant, of course, but I would point out that uh, this, this property originally, O'Neill, no relation to me, too bad, uh, was uh, McGill, the McGill estate. Uh, that property historically was apportioned for a member of the Mc McGill family. Now, subsequent, that was sold to uh, a Vicki Hayes. Uh, she had purchased that property, and she wanted to build a home there. And for some reason, uh, I can only speculate why, she uh, decided that she would s s sell the property. Now, our zoning in, in Nelsonville uh, removed this whole concept of gr 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 grandfathering so that the argument is frequently made and I would ag agree with the uh, with 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 council, you have to look at the t totality and you know, that's basically what we're looking at in terms of what we've done in, in the uh, vi 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 village. The reality is, it seems to me, and this is a, 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 a position we have taken, that if you don't enforce your zoning, you don't have zoning. And if it were a simple case where some, someone had owned this property for a number of years and finally decided they wanted to build, I would understand being, being sympathetic. However, th the purchase of this property was by a sophisticated buyer who claimed originally was not aware of the dual uh, ju jurisdictions there, which I find somewhat hard to believe. Uh, you know, we all make mistakes, but that's a pretty big one. Uh, so I think that in terms of uh, looking at this as if I were sitting there, uh, I have no ill will against the applicant. There's not a, uh, there's not a question of uh, trying to prevent them from deriving value from the land. The primary motivation I would have is to preserve the integrity of the zoning. And the reality is, this was discussed uh, at the board here somewhat, that you establish a, pr a precedent, and you may say this will not affect the next applicant. It will, because the next applicant will argue that you did provide relief here, therefore I want relief. If you don't grant that, it goes to court, and then the courts find that. So that's uh, w one of the first uh, uh, points that I, that I wanted to, to make here. It's never an easy d d decision, but we're here to serve our, our community, which is undergoing tremendous stress, and we'll see more stress. Uh, th the other point that, that I wanted to make is uh, 
uh, on this point of the imperviousness of the soil on that lot, well, I can att attest to that. Uh, I have a photograph here, which if, if council wishes to see it first, of the, uh, the D D Douglas Lane. If there is heavy rain, there is a lot of runoff. To the extent that that runoff goes across Moffat Road and into my front yard, I live across the street, and it has c cut a trough in my front yard uh, down past my uh, well in, in the front yard. Now, the former owner, uh, Ms. Hayes, uh, said she would t undertake some action to, uh, to prevent that from happening in, in the future. She did not. So my concern is if there is a house up there with a se septic system and there is this runoff taking place there, that is, it's, it seems to me there is at least a potential there to have a contaminated runoff. Now, I know the argument would be that it got Board of Health approval. Well, Board of, Board of Health make a mistake too, and the, the reality is that there is severe runoff on this, I if I might. That was taken a few weeks ago. Uh, this, this, is, this is water coming down Douglas Lane? Is that Douglas what this Lane, is? yes. It pours over and runs down Moffat Road. If it's heavy rain, heavy storm, it runs across Moffat Road onto my, my front lawn. And as I said, I asked the former owner, uh, Vicki Hayes, to address that issue. Uh, she, she did not. So at, as I say, uh, my, my contention here is that uh, this whole concept of grandfathering and so forth, from the research that I have done, not case law, but on uh, a number of municipal publications and, and journals, uh, municipalities by and large are abandoning that. And the reason they are is quite s s simple, because while that grandfathering may have worked at a particular point in time, it no longer works because for the same issue, you can't control your zoning. And if you can't control your zoning, then you don't have zoning. So here I would argue that as, uh, uh, as unpleasant as it can be, I think your first impulse has to be, look at what is going on in Phillipstown, uh, this is not a non-sophisticated buyer here that you can say, well, we have somebody here that was, as we used to say, on Wall Street is a, a comatose buyer. Uh, this is not the case. The, the purchaser of that land should have been well aware of the, the issues there. And, and f f finally, uh, uh, you know, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to point out that uh, uh, this uh, issue of uh, uh, our zoning in, in Nelsonville, which is to two acre, your zoning is 10. And again, if this were a minor, and this has been argued before our boards, where we have granted slight variances in area size, but like on an order of magnitude of 5%. Uh, this blows that completely away. So uh, I would suggest in the interest of this, this community that, you know, we need to uh, hold the line on this one. And unfortunately for an applicant, that's not what they want to hear, but I think it's what they need to hear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else like to speak on this? Anybody else want to speak? Could you identify yourself, please, microphone? Yes, hi, I'm Randy Florkey. Thank you for letting me speak. As This is my second chance to speak. I'm, in a way, going to echo uh, the mayor of Nelsonville. I am a real estate uh, broker. I have my own agency and a developer. I am pro-building, normally. Um, Vicki Hayes approached me about buying the land um, directly before she listed it, and I did some research, and they said I couldn't. They, I wasn't developable, so I was like, I wasn't interested. Um, and then I believe, I may be wrong, but I think that when uh, Miss Green bought the property, it was sold to her 
both the, the company she bought it from represented the seller and the buyer. So I think there was an interest to not disclose things because they wanted the sale to go through. Um, and as a sophisticated buyer, uh, I think Ms. Green should have known and done due diligence with an attorney and would have never signed a contract uh, prior to getting approval to build on this property. And a Board of Health is not enough uh, when you're dealing with a property with this many issues. And I think that, you know, if this were just any old person walking off the street that had never built a house before, they may not be as informed as that, but she has built several houses in the area and should have known. And I, I hate to say this, um, but I think the only conclusion can be is that they felt that um, it was better to kind of ask forgiveness after the fact and to hope that the board was not sophisticated enough to figure out these issues. That's the only conclusion I can come to because otherwise I think um, that, you know, they would have done it ahead of time, but they were willing to do the risk. And I think that is a dangerous thing. And um, in the last meeting, it was suggested that the aqueduct uh, was full of trees and stuff. And as I mentioned, the DO, DEC, or DEP, I forget which one manages it, DEC, is starting to clear cut that so that they can monitor that by helicopter. <laughs> Um, and they can't because of the growth. And they've taken out a lot already. They still have more to go, but they've taken out a lot. Yeah, you were up there, so it's, it's, I'm not exaggerating. And so the setback variance, you know, up against the stone wall, like it's very much visible and blocks the view. And it was argued last time that the viewpoint didn't matter because you couldn't see the river. I would certainly argue that the mountains are equally as beautiful as the river. And if you put a blunt structure there, that is impeding the views. And, and so I think like having it up against the aqueduct and the stone walls, which I mean, you walk out our front door, or look out of our stairwell window or whatever, um, you can clearly see it. And, I, and so I would argue that it is, it is not just the river that is the view, it is also. So I think that in conclusion is most of my points. Thank, Thank you. you for indulging. Yes. Mr. Healy, I think, right? Mr. Meyer. Meyer, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. That's okay. I appreciate it. Stuff tonight. That's Go okay. Ahead. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk and, and just say a few words. Um, and, I, and I have uh, written a few down. But I do feel at the end of the day, you have heard me speak about this a number of times at this point. Uh, our family feels, as well as the neighbors, that this is a matter of right and wrong. Uh, this is just a matter of, it's a very simple issue. It's trying to be overcomplicated, we feel, by the applicant. They're trying to make the neighbors in the area out to be bad people just because we're just asking for the enforcement of the zoning code and they feel, feel that we've held them up. But, but like I said, we felt that certain things have been misrepresented or tried to be glossed over and we've just asked for, to, plain and simple, for what's on the books written in the code to, to, to be enforced. Um, and and the, the qu our question is, what is the message the board would be sending by granting any variances? Is it, is it to ask for forgiveness rather than asking for permission? Don't do any due diligence uh, on the property you'd like to purchase, even if you're an experienced developer. Uh, build a two and a half story house at the top of the highest point on the property to maximize your view of the mountains and disregard the visual intrusion and negative visual impacts on the area's visual aesthetics. Is it to, immediate, to, to allow someone to come in, they already have a three-bedroom septic, and immediately apply for a four-bedroom septic to maximize the size of the house and, and obviously their profit uh, on the site? And does that seem like the sign of somebody who's interested in putting an appropriately sized home on, the, on proportionally the smallest lot in the neighborhood? What it, what it says to us is that they want to maximize the size of the house and the profit on a lot that's 95% too small in the neighborhood and then claim that they didn't know any better. Is it to allow someone to build on a landlocked piece of property in the town without access within the town to a town road, which is required pursuant to 280A uh, of the town law? And don't worry if you have any self-inflicted hardships uh, requiring unprecedented variances in the town. They would just worry about the variances later. And if you meet any resistance, just hire your attorneys 
and fight it like crazy. This developer has no one to blame but herself on this. She, as, as Mr. Flork said, she, she went out there and attempted to do this without doing the due diligence. And not every piece of property in the town is buildable, in, including this one. Variances shouldn't be an afterthought. The zoning board should not be an afterthought. And the zoning code itself should not be an afterthought. And the question in our mind is whether the town is willing to, to uh, reward this type of behavior. Uh, when we brought up the fact that the developer blatantly disregarded the conditions set forth on Jaycox Road, and I even believe that that's sort of been glossed over at this point, uh, the neighbors came out in full force against the way that she handled the first house. And they asked the planning board to put, she went and she had the first house, she subdivided it. And then when they went to do the next one, the neighbors came out in full force and said, don't do what you did on the last one. Don't clear cut the trees. Planning board put those specific conditions in and she blatantly disregarded it. When she was called on it, she just didn't pay the fine. She took them to, to a full trial. And ultimately, as a result of that, they found her guilty of that. So it wasn't just that it was a mistake. She went, she moved forward. She was specifically called out on that. In response to that in the paperwork, in response to our submission, uh, the, the applicant's attorney indicated that uh, she's built seven or eight houses. So fine, great, we understand that. So she should have known better on this property. We, we believe that. Nelsonville, when it did, as the mayor said, Nelsonville, this did come before the, the Nelsonville ZBA. And uh, we believe that, as the mayor said, that the applicant got the message. They, they felt that it was clear the ZBA was coming out. They were saying, and, and the mayor, uh, and one of the trustees back in March when, when the applicant was before this board. Was that when the house was in the, in the center? Right? That's correct, okay. yes. Okay. And, and, and the, the mayor and one of the trustees came out at that March meeting and said, the, the, the village is not in favor of this. This is not uh, what our zoning calls for, and, and we're going to request uh, that it be scrutinized. And the developer got the message. So what did they do? No one forced them. They moved it into the town. And that is, is basically called form shopping. They were looking for the path of least resistance on this. Nobody told them they had to do it. They're trying to put it up anyhow on the highest point to maximize any mountain views that they have. So, the, so this isn't that the zoning code needs to be modified or anything else. It's the project or the applicant's approach to this project that needs to be modified. The zoning code isn't broken. It's just that her approach to this is indicating that she wants it completely bent in order to, to, uh, to favor what she wants to do. So the community and the neighborhood's asking this board to send a message. Not every piece of property in the town is can be developed and for purchasers, especially experienced ones, to do their due diligence prior to purchasing the property. So don't maximize the size of the house to make it the largest house on, proportionally on the smallest lot in the neighborhood. Do not maximize the visual intrusion on top of the hill, that's the highest portion of the property just to maximize your view of the mountains. And do not immediately come in and increase the size of the septic to four bedrooms when you already had three bedroom septic approval causing the septic field on the property to actually be larger, forcing the location of the house to be even more narrowly defined. And did, did the applicant offer to sell the property to the neighbors as the case law requires? As one of the alternatives, the case law asks that, 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 the, uh, that the applicant look and see if one of the neighbors will, will purchase it. Did she offer to move it down the hill, try to, try to get it into Nelsonville and complete that process? She didn't do that. What options did she pursue? And did she put in any contingencies in her contract of sale to say, I'm going to go out and see if I can get uh, a building permit from the town. Uh, and if I can't, then I won't purchase the property. She just went out and purchased it and, and moved forward. So when the developer and the builder came in at that March meeting, Mr. Lim actually asked the applicant, what's the size of the property? It seems like a very basic question, pretty straightforward, uh, as simple as it gets. And the, and, and the response was, and you can read it in the minutes, was the builder said uh, two or two-ish, and, and the developer said 2.1, when the actual size of the property in Phillipstown is 0.55 acres. It's 0.884 acres in the village for a total of 1.434 acres total, not 2.1. That's 33% larger than, than that's, it couldn't be a, a more simple uh, question that you ask. And so, so to say that it's 2.1 acres when you've owned it for, for, for quite a period of time just seems to be, can anybody honestly say that that, that was just a mistake, that it was 2.1 acres? Uh, it, it wouldn't seem so. And so we're asking you a very simple question that, that I felt that you asked, Mr. Chairman. Can you consider 
the Nelsonville portion, the 0.88 acres, or do you just have to focus on the 0.55 acres? Town Law 261 says that the zoning board reviews uh, the, the portions, their zoning controls of the area within the town outside of the incorporated villages. I don't know why you would look into to Nelsonville. If you, if you want to look at the Nelsonville piece, I would encourage you to understand all aspects of the Nelsonville piece because Douglas Lane that the mayor spoke of, which is the driveway that runs in, it runs to, to my family's property as, as well as to Mr. Flork's property, is actually on, the, on their property in Nelsonville. It's, it's 20 feet wide by approximately 600 feet long of, of which the developer owns. That's over a quarter acre, uh, almost a third of an acre is the driveway. It can't be built on. So the actual size of the lot is not 0.884. It, that's the actual size of the lot. But the driveway takes up, it, that's not, it's not adjacent to the driveway. The driveway and Douglas Lane is actually part of the parcel. So it's more like point. Five, five, it's, it's half an acre. It might be smaller uh, what you can build on than the Nelsonville piece. So I'd encourage you uh, to, to uh, fully, under, if you're going to count that or try to build it into the conversation, that it's 1.434 acres, it would seem that you would want to understand all aspects, what can be built on Nelsonville, what they feel like, because otherwise, when you really do understand it, it's much smaller, uh, uh, potentially smaller, uh, that could be utilized for, for this piece. So... Uh, the, and the town board increased the zoning in the area to 10 acres. That was, the, it, it, that was in recognition of the spirit and intent of the comprehensive plan. The zoning code is there to apply the comprehensive plan. And the whole point is of the comprehensive plan is to preserve and protect the scenic and environmental attributes of the property in the rural conservation zoning areas of the town. And that's what this is in, rural conservation, which is 10 acres. Um, as, you, as you're aware, pursuant to the town's natural resource and open space protection plan, this property is located within the statewide area of scenic significance mm -hmm. and also visible from a significant viewpoint. Um, as we stated in our January 29th uh, submission, the parcel is also in the town's scenic overlay protection district and is adjacent to and visible from a property listed on the National Register of Historic Places, which is the Healy property. It was, in the response to our submission, the applicant indicated that just the house is in the, the historic, uh, historic place, uh, historic uh, list. But we do have the application, and it shows the entire property, uh, even though it was in separate parcels, is, is on the National Registry of Historic Places. So it can easily be seen. We, we could see it right from Libby Healy's house. You can see right through uh, um, uh, where the house will be located. And so it's clear that this will be visible from many places on, a, on, on that parcel of property. And um, we believe... I understand, and I'm going to cut you short a little bit, okay? I'll give you another five or ten minutes, and that's five, it. I okay. need less than five. Okay, all right. I appreciate that. All it was right. just I was cut short last time for the cell no, tower, no, so I just want to get short. it. You have plenty of time. Okay, I appreciate it. Don't, uh, uh, cut you. don't start that uh, on me, uh, I won't. I won't. I, I'm a, I got two paragraphs to go. <laughs> okay, you got it. I appreciate it. You just, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so as we stated in the past, if we were to approve these variances, the precedent this board would set would have significant and substantial consequences for future parcels in similarly situated circumstances. If you were to grant the requested variances, we have no doubt that the developer would go to Cold Spring tomorrow and request to purchase that parcel as immediately adjacent to this one. She would have every reason to. That parcel is larger than this one and has sufficient frontage on Moffett Road. So they'd need even fewer variances on that one. She would believe she would not need to come to the board first. She'd take it from any decision here tonight approving the variances that the message is that due diligence is not necessary and the precedent would dictate uh, based on this parcel being larger and having frontage and not being landlocked that she will more likely than not get her approvals. Otherwise, um, and the result would be two houses on 1.22 acres. So the Cold Spring parcel and this parcel that she owns combined would be 1.22 acres. And what you'll end up with based on precedent is two houses that's collectively zoned for 20 acres on 1.22 acres. And that's what the precedent would be. And we feel that it shouldn't be about the board's gut reaction or personal feelings about denying the developer the right to use her property. We believe that we have previously submitted and, and through the, the comments we've heard, heard here tonight that uh, we've provided you with every opportunity and all the necessary information that you need to deny this application and the variances uh, through the analysis of the five factors. 
Um, finally, last paragraph. We, 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 That's a good word. All right, you're welcome. Uh, it's about complying with the zoning law and, more importantly, the comprehensive plan. Uh, we can understand bending the law to accommodate someone looking to work with the neighborhood and the community and building an appropriately sized residence that blends in with the neighborhood. But someone with this track record and someone who should have known better, asking for forgiveness rather than permission and requesting unprecedented variances just because she did not want to perform the due diligence that anyone else in the community is required to perform, should not be permitted to do so. Deliberate ignorance should not be encouraged by the board, and she should not receive a windfall for that deliberate ignorance. What type of message does that send to others? We are asking the board not to set a precedent in the town and not to choose developers over residents, the, the environment, and the rural nature of this part of the community. I'd submit that this is not the message we should be sending as a community as to how to develop property in the town, and we believe the zoning code and the comprehensive plan unmistakably supports this position. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Richmond, I'm sure you want to. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd just briefly like to respond to some of the points that were raised. First of all, I do want to point out, I, I, I think this zoning board, more than anyone else knows, that it has a function in this society. It has a function under the town code, and it's to provide relief where the zoning code leads to unjust results. Um, to, say, to come before a zoning board and say, well, you're bound to strictly adhere to the zoning code, if that were it and this board were just a rubber stamp, I think you know that that's not what the code was meant to be. Um, again, I think the board is, as I think some of the speakers recognize, under an obligation here to look at the totality of the circumstances, and I think we've shown the totality of the circumstances show that this would house be a house that would fit in with the neighborhood. Um, in terms of the precedent, I heard some, I mean, Let's be honest, I think we've all been doing zoning for a while. This is a pretty unprecedented situation. I'm not sure we'll ever see replicated in our lifetime. It's a parcel that's in two different municipalities that we think was, is a legal non-conforming lot. Um, I don't think that's a legitimate concern either, respectfully, although um, I understand why they might raise it. I would also point out the reason we did go. You're right, we started in Nelsonville, and it was not because we read the tea leaves, we had then, as a result of that meeting, had some very constructive discussions with staff both in the town and the village, and as a result of that, that's why the house was pushed into Nelsonville. It was felt, I think, by all sides. Phillipstown, Phillipstown yes, I'm sorry. Yes. That this would I be- to Nelsonville. <laughs> you said this, right, 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 right. Yes, yeah, so we got, and I think the feeling was we were just gonna be playing, being ping-ponged for the rest of the time, right. and that it took, Thank you. So I think I, you. I, you know, I'm really. It's a shame that it's so hard to deal with two different municipalities. But unfortunately, there's different laws, different zoning laws, and understood. If you happen to buy a piece of property where the town runs through the middle of it, right? You know, right. so I, 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 I can understand that. Uh, anything else? Uh, Glenn, I'd like to just briefly address. I know there was a drainage issue raised. I think, as you've all heard, we already do have Department of Health approval for a septic system. I think shows that a septic system safely can be used. I think. One of the speakers made the point, well, we switched from a three to four. As we pointed out in our submission, shifting from three to four has no impact on the massing of the building or how it would be impacted. Um, one of the speakers also talked, while well, Glenn's getting ready to just throw out, that the rear yard setback, in all honesty, there, even if the trees have been cut down on the aqueduct, that's still 200 feet of buffering. I mean, so if we're talking about a 50-foot setback, the reality is that the, you were good, you know, even just, even if we were requesting 100 barons, there would still be 200 feet between us and the nearest property line. Can I'm going, a sure. Uh, I got a letter. Where you've already been, not approved, but the, the building inspector from Nelsonville says that he's going to give you a driveway permit, correct? Yes, yes. If we okay. Can. Uh, in our building inspector's letter, I still don't understand this, okay? It says an open development area permit from the building inspector or the planning board before a building permit may be issued. So are you gonna to have to get that from Nelsonville building inspector? My How do you read that? Mr. Warner was speaking about that we would have to get that from the town, but that would just be a ministerial thing. I mean, I think that was the point Which of- the town? We would get from the town of Phillipstown. I, I, I'm not quite, no, But I then the driveway, we would have to this. get a driveway permit from the village. No, you gotta, you're going to get a driveway permit from yes. um, the village. Nelsonville. Yes. Right. But this one here says open area, development area permit. Can you explain to me what yeah, that is? I think that essentially, I mean, Adam, I understand that's essentially the driveway permit. I don't know. That doesn't say driveway to me. It says open. 
issue notice. Sure. The open development area general regulations of the town of Phillips Town, in which is available to most towns, or I guess all towns, is a method by which people can access multiple lots by a private driveway. Right. And all of the private roads, the ones with the white signs in the town that have been created since 1961, are have been created under the open development regulations. There are conditions in those regulations that allow that mandate mandate that the planning board approve a new road and approve existing roads under certain circumstances, and there's a. Uh, and, and thus the driveway permits can be issued. And there's also a circumstance where the building inspector has the authority to issue a building permit based on a pre-existing road that serviced a driveway, uh, serviced a house. And uh, well, question, I don't know the details of how that will be applied in the town, but it's the process by which you get access via a private road. Right. Right. I understand that he's got the, dri the driveway. He's got to get the driveway permit. But I don't under what I don't understand is what he's saying here, open area development permit. Well, that's that's inspection. the regulation under which that, that he's saying the driveway permit would be. It's the oh. open area development so you don't general need another regulations. Permit is my question. Pardon me? You don't need an open, you don't need a thing called an open area development permit. Uh, like I said, I, I know there's a way that you might not need it. I don't know what the building inspector will do, but oh, he's, he's referring. you need it. Yeah. Building inspector in Nelsonville. Oh, stand up, please, and identify yourself. I'm Dana Simmons. The building inspector in Nelsonville said, I will give you a driveway permit based on the open area development, the, what oh, you're so talking about. So that's what the permit is based on. All right, so on. that's handled by the Nelsonville building Correct. inspector. Correct. That's what the permit, that's what. Okay, that answers my question. Okay. okay. Yes, one second, please, Mr. That. Hill. I'll, I'll get to you. Sit down, please. Go ahead. All right. I, um, there's. Just a couple of things I want to point out to you. Oh, he answered my question. Yeah, no. I was getting up for something else when the question no, came up. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll little, be happy to sit back down if you want me to. So well. Go ahead. Um, there have been a couple of things that have been said tonight that are just um, inaccurate. Uh, Montrest is 1,400 feet away. If you go onto the website, of, and you look up Montrest, it says it's the building and it's some of the outbuildings. They're on different parcels, 1,400 feet away. Um, the notion of impact on a historic building, the primary purpose of those they're not regulations. In fact, you can do anything you want with a historic building if you own it and you're just doing it privately. But when you assess impacts on historic buildings, the biggest focus, not the only focus, is what can you see when you look at the historic building? Not what, to a lesser extent, a much lesser extent, is what is seen from the historic building. If we were to deny building permits for everything that could see Montrest, or, or that, I'm sorry, excuse me, that Montrest could see, it'd be, you know, anything towards, between the river, or an awful lot of the property between Montrest and the river would, would not be eligible for building permits. The fact is that Montrest is situated on a separate piece of property. It was separate in 1909, or no, into 1909 when the aqueduct came through. Um, and those pieces are in separate ownership. Still in the family, but they're in separate ownership. The uh, family trust owns Montrest, the building itself, and the land it's on. One of Libby Healy's, Healy, Libby Healy's daughter, I think she has two, but his, her, her daughter owns the other piece and her son Gordon owns yet another piece. So the family has split that property up. So, so what we're really talking about, to my way of thinking, is the impact from 1,400 feet away. There's been some indication that I pointed out last month, I'm going to switch horses now, that's all I have to say about mantras. There was some indication last month that I had said um, that, well, you're gonna see over this building and see the river. And tonight, Mr. Florek said, well, I'm also interested in seeing the mountains. But if you can see the river and you look up even further higher, you'll see the mountains. 
So it's it, what he's going to be looking down in the backdrop for him is going to be the O'Neill's house. It's going to be the former Moranti's house. Maybe you'll see the Mar uh, Levine's house. Uh, he may see the uh, he may already see the Myers house. He will see another building. There's no no question about it. But it's not going to impede his mountain view. One of the things that so. Before I, I leave that chart, if you see that green patch there, it's been implied, at least if not said, that the building is going to be in the historic district, I mean, in the scenic protection overlay zone. It is not. The property, a portion, that green portion of the property, is in the historic overlay zone. I'm going to go over there again. This line that cuts about two thirds of that green line, two thirds north of that line, is the village of Cold Springs property. So it's only the bottom third of that green that's in the property and is not where the house is going to be built. The septic is going to be built in there, but it's not there. Another point, so I, now I can leave that one. On exactly where on that map is the house? The can house we locate it? Right here. Okay. And I think you have copies of this in your book. Yeah, right. Map. Yes, no. And and this portion of the property is in the historic, uh, in the scenic protection overlay zone, and there is some <coughs> intrusion into that area with the septic system. I guess I'm not going to leave it. What this also shows you is there's a stand of trees right in front of Montress that, that probably not completely blocks their view, but partially blocks their view. That's demonstrated here. This is a picture of Montress when you look at the map, when, and you can see the trees are behind Montress, and this is an overview where you can see the line of sight going right through that stand of trees. So that, that, that view is an in-your-face in view, and it's... 1,470 <coughs> feet away. The most recent letter from Mr. Myers' lawyer, attorney um, stated that we were building on, the, on a ridge line. Um, I had these profiles last month, but I redrew them because they were, they were disproportionate or made them more closer to right proportion. But I'm going to go over here. This line here, this B line, is going right through the house. And that's a plan view of it. It shows you the uphill side to the left on the map and the downhill side to the right. We took that profile off and we drew, drew that profile. And we get 729 feet past the property and 114 feet above the property before the property starts to crest or before there's a ridge line. I think, if I remember correctly, it's in, the, it's in Mr. Richmond's letter. It's, I think it's about three quarters of a mile to the nearest ridge line. So we're not impacting a ridge line. Um, and one thing I, I'll say that, even though he should be saying it, but, um, one thing, that our zoning law does do, that Nelsonville zoning law doesn't, doesn't do, it does provide for properties that have been damaged by the zoning. So you have a whole section on non-conforming laws, and, and, and maybe we shouldn't be, you know, uh, there's something wrong with a, with a law that says we're going we're gonna to change our law to make it so you can't yours, use your property because it's too small. Phillipstown didn't do that, and, I, and I'm not sure they think it was exactly the right thing, as, as, as good an idea for Nelsonville, ultimately. Um, <coughs> one other point I wanted to make that I'm not making. Oh, and some, there was an implication here that if you're a good old boy and you've been living here for a long time and maybe you got a problem, we're going to have some mercy on you. But if you're new, 
we're not going to give you any mercy. I, that's, that's what I heard. Maybe not so directly and bluntly stated, but that's what I heard. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Meyer. Uh, I, I wanna, oh, go ahead. I, I, I wanted to um, ask um, oh, wait just one second. Mr. Watson and or uh, the attorney for the uh, applicant uh, to address the drainage issue that was brought up, because, you know, that's something I would be concerned about. Drainage is something you can and should be concerned about. Uh, there were two issues raised, whether there would be an increase in, in, uh, in flooding caused by the, uh, by the construction, and, and I remember the other point I wanted to make, and, then, and, and that we would be further damaging this, the pipe that runs through the property. Uh, with regard to the pipe that's running through the property, it's right here. It's on, the, it's on the uphill side of the construction. The construction doesn't interfere with the pipe. The drainage runs away from the pipe, not into the pipe, and we stated that. Um, the issue of drainage from the roof and drainage from the, uh, the, drive, the additional driveway, um, I talk with the engineers in our office and we can infiltrate those, we can, inf we can put in dry wells to catch the roof drains and direct the, the water from the driveway into, into, into dry wells and we'll, we will do that and we would accept that as a condition. What about the concern that uh, the mayor of Nelsonville uh, had uh, raised about the septic system uh, flowing into his property? Well, you know, he said the health, he said the health department can be wrong. I, Putnam County has some, probably the strongest <coughs> set of regulations with regard to septic systems that we have. Certainly it's stronger than Westchester. It's way stronger than Dutchess and Orange counties. And, and you, not only do you have to be able to build a complete septic system, you have to re be able to replace it 100%. There's no leeway with regard to the maximum slope on driveways on, 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 across the septic system. Um, we we went by the state standards in terms of in terms of the percolation rates and we passed all of that we've designed and been reviewed by a sep by by the health department to have a permit i don't could the health department be wrong could we be wrong obviously in the extreme case we could but you know we've done everything that we can to prove to them that we've that that the septic system will work. They've reviewed our plans, and we've given us a permit. Um, we don't believe that will happen. Is this a pump-up system? No. Okay. Um, the last thing, uh, Mr. Meyer made a... He wanted to subtract the driveway out of, out of the uh, calculation of the area. Phillipstown used to do that. He used to not be able to count that, but that... The new law takes, doesn't have that in there. The new law does not make you subtract any easements. So it still counts if it were in Phillipstown. I know it's in Nelsonville. But the fact of the matter is that we're going to be using it as a driveway for the for access. I'm going to say that for two-thirds of our driveway is going to be that very driveway, and that's very part and parcel of building a house. You have a driveway, and that's usable property, and we're going to use it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Meyer. I didn't bring any paper with me this time, so I could get through it. The, uh, yeah, just, sure. just quickly, uh, just a few. Uh, that's uh, important. Yeah, I realize that. Uh, I we'll appreciate it. Take your time. And well, I, and take I, your time. Um, uh, the, I do believe that there's an issue with the Scenic Protection Overlay District and, and the way that um, Mr. Watson interprets it and, and the way that it's handled there uh, because Moffat Road is actually in the village of uh, Nelsonville as it cuts through there, but if you go directly 250 feet off of that through the village to the town, I do believe that the building inspector would interpret it to say that that, that house is well within the Scenic Protection uh, Overlay District. Um, uh, with regard to Nelsonville and the driveway permit, 
there's no such thing in Nelsonville as a driveway permit, actually. Uh, if it's site development, which a driveway is considered in the village in Nelsonville, they need a building permit, just like if they're going to construct anything else, and they, ne they need variances. So I at have the an email from your building inspector. Right. Who says he's going to issue a driveway? Permit. No, so what he so said you're is you're going to have to talk to him. So what he said is, and right, and we would address that at the appropriate time if they, if they, uh, if they went. I, and, I have nothing to do with it. I mean, let's just say this board has nothing to do with the driveway permit in Nelsonville. I was just clarifying because you had indicated so. So they need because you had. But, has, but it doesn't make a point. It, it doesn't make a point. He already said he's going to issue them a driveway permit. He said he was going to issue them an appropriate permit. He, he said that he permit. would provide an appropriate permit. Exact words with driveway permit. Uh, that's his exact words. Now, if you want to have, you could take that up with him. Right. And so that's what we intend to do. All I'm saying is right. there's no such thing as a driveway permit in the Fine. village of Nelsonville. I don't know that. And I'm so not the no, building inspector for Nelsonville. And so there's clearly no guarantees that they would get that. And at the appropriate time, okay. we would address that, as you said, with the ZBA and the variances that would be required because it's site development. It's, there's no such thing as a driveway. Right. Now, now I think you're getting a little bit beyond point, okay? Because, like I say, this, this slide comes to me, this came from your building inspector. So I have to believe him. Okay. Right, I was just clarifying that they, that they don't have you're, one. You're and I'm clarifying that he yeah. said a driveway permit. Yeah. Now, if that's the, if not the correct terminology, I don't know. Right. Okay. Okay. Any that's else? All, no, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank yes, you. sir. Just two brief comments, if I might rebuttal. Uh, sure. Uh, it, there was an implication that we have a w welcome neighbor a policy in Nelsonville that we would grant forgiveness to one of the good old boys. Simply not true. The, the point is we apply our codes, our regulations evenly. We encourage newcomers to this area. My point was this was a sophisticated buyer that should have known the issues intended on this, this property. This is not a good old boy or versus, you know, a newcomer issue at all. Doesn't drive any of this. Secondly, my admiration for the Putnam County Board of Health is second to none. However, when they conduct a test up there, they are not conducting a test in the pouring rain. And that the reality is the runoff from there cut a six inch trough in my front lawn for several hundred feet running by my w well. We also get a flow of water coming out there. It was described as an impervious uh, surface. That appears to be true. I mean, the reality is my point is not an attack on the Board of Health. It is simply looking at a fact that what is happening with runoff from there is damaging. And the concern that I expressed is if that is coupled with a septic system, the potential exists, if you will, that it might um, uh, create a toxic uh, situation for my supply of, of water. And the trough, as I say, it was not a figment of my imagination. That happened just this last few days. We're getting the runoff again. And coupled with the septic system, that may be uh, toxic. So thank you again, board. Thank you. Uh, anybody else would like to speak to this? I'll just take really quickly. Third? You're taking a third, third time? <laughs> I, is, I didn't realize you Okay, could, but like, this is it. Three shots, you're out. I didn't realize you could take photos and bring photos. I would have done that. Going to the water runoff with this recent, it is a pond, literally a frozen pond where? still today at the end of the driveway. So right where Douglas Lane starts, okay. right in front. It is literally, there are stone pillars, which may be on the survey. Right. From there forward is a solid frozen pond. Okay, from like the my driveway. Go from ahead. the driveway runoff. Right. Okay, and then getting back to, I believe the the surveyor mentioned that like, <laughs> I would see other houses from my property. I don't see another house from my property. Okay, this and just this was what was originally there when they said there's overgrowth. Right. When they said that you know there was overgrowth there, that's right. what it looked like before. Here's what it looks like now after this DEP. Look it down. Their house they're going to build is right there. Okay. Okay, there is no, there are no. But there are a lot of other people who look at other houses. There are. But I'm just saying, they said, they said, I, mean, no, I look at other houses. That there was overgrowth and there wouldn't be, you wouldn't see it from one. Oh, okay. They said that. That's your point. Okay, I that's see. my point. Okay. Okay, and that it said that I see other houses. I don't see another house. Well, you're lucky. I know, right? That's very good. Uh, anybody else? No. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, there's a lot of information that's been provided. 
by uh, different attorneys and so on and so forth. Um, we have to go over to, in order to make a decision, we have to go over what's called five factors, okay? Uh, I'm going to hold this over to our next meeting, which is March 12th. And all I'm going to do is go over to five factors. Right, let me finish. Go over to five factors, and then we'll vote on it. Mr. Chairman, do you want to close the public hearing? Well, let me, let me, you got to, let me, speak, you want to speak? Go ahead. I think, Mr. Chair, that I was going to suggest with Mr. Sistone's consent. I think the We're going to close the public hearing. Close the public hearing. Now, can we close the public hearing and still go over the five factors? Oh, absolutely. The five factors is just part of the decision. If, if you're satisfied that you have enough information, by all means, uh, it would be appropriate to close the public hearing. Right. And uh, and put this over for decision until uh, next month. And let me ask you a question: As as next month we go over the five factors, do the attorneys have uh, an opportunity to respond to that? Uh, we have two, we're going to have two attorneys here, I would imagine. Uh, yeah, well, you know, you know what I'm trying to say. Well, when when the public hearing is closed, uh, that generally means that. Um, no new evidence or testimony. Uh, no new it, evidence. It, I mean, I'm just trying to say if they have a uh, give their reason for, the, for the, maybe for the, to, to the five factors. What I'm trying to say. Or we go from what they presented. Uh, you you can do e either or. If you close the the, the public hearing, um, th there's no new evidence. Uh, th there's no new testimony. If if you want to leave it open simply to have some more dialogue about the five factors. You can do that as well. They can. I'm not sure what what you know. The five factors is the analysis you have to right. apply under the town law to decide if they need area variances. Right. Depending. Well, I on think there's enough information supplied by both attorneys here on, on the five factors. I mean, you, Mr. I would suggest, uh, Chairman, if there's no if there's no harm, we we keep keep it open. And if there's any no, I'm, no, I, I'm not. I'm not going to do that because it's. Uh, there's enough information here and so on and so forth. And uh, if I keep the public hearing open, uh, it's just going to give everybody else a chance to speak. And I think pretty much everybody involved has given their opinion and so on and so forth. And we do have the five factors. Uh, uh, if I can, I'm, you know, and this is why I'm asking. If, as we go over the five factors, if I give each of you a chance to... Uh, Mr. Chairman, we can always close it. And if they want to make comment, we can always reopen it. Correct? So that, yeah, but I mean, you can make a motion to, to reopen. My, my suggestion would be we, we received a lot of materials, I believe both council um, right. and all parties submitted the materials they need to submit. Um, there's a lot of information to digest, obviously. Um, so I think it's appropriate um, to close the public hearing unless you, you want more um, no, I don't evidence. Want, I don't want more, more testimony. I, I think there's if enough. If they in simply there. want to go over the five factors, you can. I mean, it's in their papers. I suppose I don't want to foreclose anyone. They could do it now. But if we have all the information that we need, um, it would be appropriate to close. If you want more information or more testimony, you can leave it open. No, I think there's enough in it at, this, at this point in time. So I make a motion. I make a motion to close the public hearing. Got a second. A second. All in favor? Aye. I do. Well, uh, public hearing is closed, and uh, I say next, uh, that'll be March 12, 730, we go over to five factors and make a decision, make a voting on it. Thank you. Uh, all right, next I'm going to do Mr. Garduso. I'm going to do you. You, you. you were last, but you and I had enough time looking at each other. We don't need any more time. <laughs> That's right. I'm sure we will. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Robert Cotioso on behalf of the applicant, Palmal Broadcasting. Um, we, we did submit the revised materials uh, and the additional materials that we discussed last month, which was the uh, co-location and removal agreement, uh, the full environmental assessment form with the visual assessment and the photographs, uh, the insurance, and we did... Uh, revised the site plan. I did have an opportunity to speak to Mr. Gaynor. We added uh, the full property, the surrounding zoning, the silt fence, and the uh, structural notes on the plans as well. Okay. I see we have a uh, answer back from Putnam County on it. On I saw it. that as yeah. well. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right, uh, Ron. You want to say if there's anything else we need here? No. You have a technical memorandum from my office. I've reviewed the latest materials. Um, there's some 
Further guidance we hope to get from the board's attorney just to confirm the completeness of the application that typically would relate to new towers and their applicability. So once you have that in hand, you can finally move this along. Um, my my uh, memorandum also indicated that they, they now relocated the tower to meet side yard setbacks, but I have misread the plan. Uh, they still require a variance, which is from this board, for the side yard setback, which was discussed at the original meeting. Okay. So there's running else we need, I guess is what I'm asking here. No, well, just, just, the, just the guidance from the attorney to clarify that the application materials in hand satisfy the requirements for filing. Okay. Yeah, well, as um, <laughs> I understand it, it's going to be a... Uh, a a tower reconstructed at, at the same height as the, the present tower right. uh, in the same location. Is that correct? Within, I think it's 15 to 20 feet. Can I ask you to leave quiet, but you're still doing this. If you want to talk, please go outside. Thank you. Yeah, if you're, it, it's a replacement of the existing tower, and we'll be able to put Putnam County. I think we submitted some letters from Putnam County in there, emergency services. So we'll put the other tower right next to it, and then take down the old tower so nothing goes offline but that's correct what you said I, I, mean, I, I would consider uh, it, it seems under the code um, that the tower would be considered a, uh, a non-conforming uh, pre-existing non-conforming structure um, so just going over the, the technical uh, memorandum I believe that um, looking at the section I, I think the biggest one was the setback and what we had said is that we would feel more comfortable asking for the variance um, making we, we had put in the papers is that it was originally approved back in the 50s as a public utility and it's being replaced and there was a change in the plan based on the new tower and therefore we didn't need to comply with the setback but what I had suggested to mr. Gaynor and what we had put in the letter is that we would notice it to include that setback variance. If we needed it, we needed it. If we don't need it, we don't need it. So that way we, we're basically being very conservative about the issue. Okay, okay. yeah. Um, and, and just to uh, respond, um, I believe the technical memorandum asked whether um, uh, all of the information that's required in section 175.46 uh, would still be required under the circumstances simply because they're, they're essentially reconstructing an already existing tower uh, to make upgrades to the structure uh, of the tower. And uh, the question was whether those code provisions reply. And the way I read those code provisions, it's specifically 175-46B1, uh, says that no communications tower except those approved prior to the effective date of this chapter shall be constructed, maintained, or used unless in conformity with these regulations and this chapter. So I understand it. Um, uh, this is a, a tower as it exists now that uh, was approved prior to the effective date of this chapter. So those provisions would not apply. All right, I believe we have all the information we need. Does anybody feel that any more information is needed? Uh, public hearing. Oh, oh, okay. Well, I can wait till the public hearing. Yeah, I'll wait till the public hearing. You All right. On it. Unless you okay. think you need any more information from Mr. No, Godioso. So. I was going to ask about um, one of the environmental documents that she's provided. Um, I I made some notes, but I can I can wait till the public Great. hearing. Great. Thank you. All okay. right. Uh, at this point in time, I get a motion that the application is complete. I make a motion. Make a motion. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, Mr. Godos, we'll set this down for a public hearing March 12th at uh, 7.30 p.m. at this Great. building here. And we'll, we'll take care of the notice. We'll include the special permit and the variance and the extent it's needed. I believe you send the notices, but we have to send it to the sururrounding, yeah, jurisdictions, the surrounding jurisdictions and right. Putnam County Emergency Services. Is that right? Okay. And okay. do we need a sign on the property for this one? No, we don't have, we don't, we no don't have sign to sign on this one. No. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. And don't, uh, we don't do signs. Yeah. I think huh? I'm sorry? I think it would be helpful to have a sign so that, you Well, know. I'm saying that we don't have signs is what I'm trying to say. Uh, I mean, yeah, there's you, a weird you know. code provision that actually... It provides it, but the code does uh, mandate that sign be placed on the property. Yeah. Oh, really? Then why don't we have any signs? <laughs> All right, put a sign up. Yeah. <laughs> So that neighbors can know right. that. Well, I'm just trying to say, you understand what you're trying to say, but the town has no sign. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just, just a little. We had the same issue with prior application. Yeah. And that was again resolved directly by the applicant. If, if, if town codes and signs, why don't we have signs? I'm with you. Okay. Ask so the building the inspector why we won't have signs. We agree. <laughs> yeah, we had one. We had one built. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. No, we'll sir. see you in March. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's good. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron. March 12, 7.30, yep. Uh, next one is uh, 200 Jaycox Road. Hey, all right, huh? Well, she... See? Nobody cares about you. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, you took the tripod. Oh, he took the tripod, yeah. He took it up when we took it and went home. Oh, we have one. <laughs> oh, wow. We've got our own tripod. All right. Good go. We don't have any signs, but we've got a tripod. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. I do have a couple additional materials. Uh, it doesn't change the application. What, what are they? Okay. Oh, you changed the elevations? They, it clarifies the building height and um, all the up you can get. Okay. So there are seven. Feeling Thank you. Thank you. My name's Karen Park. Oh, wait a second. Oh. We've got to get all the information. Sorry. She's quick, but she's not that quick. Okay. Okay. I thought I'd get the intro out of the way while you're. <laughs> uh, no, that's okay. Right. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. My name's Karen Parks, and I'm here tonight representing David and Ann Provan, who are the property owners for 200 Jaycox Road, and they're also here tonight. Um, and our application before you is for a side, side yard variance. We're proposing a single story addition to their single family residence. And um, the, I don't know if I should talk into the microphone. Um, the mic cage, the mic over here. Just with the whole bowl. Just slide it over. Oh, you can take the mic out. Okay. Right, okay. Okay. Um, so our application, again, is to add a single-story addition to the residence. And because of various site constraints that exist, uh, we're really constrained to adding the addition to the southerly end of the house. The site constraints that I'm talking about are the location of the existing driveway um, and access to the existing garage. Um, the Can you speak a little bit of Sure, sorry. So to the north side of the building is the existing driveway and access to the existing garage. To the westerly side, there's an existing swimming pool. And to the easterly side is the septic system, the tank and fields for the residents. So we're really restricted in terms of an addition versus going up, um, which we feel is a greater impact and doesn't achieve the goals that are desired here, but also a greater impact to neighbors is to add the addition to the southerly side of the building. Um, so because of the shape of the lot and the existing position of the house on the lot, um, our proposed addition is sitting within the side yard setback. And the setback that we're requesting is 11 feet to a proposed deck and 14 feet 
to the nearest corner of the proposed addition. So the variance we're actually requesting is a 19-foot variance to the side yard. If you went north, you wouldn't need a variance. That's correct. However, what's happening to the north of the building, we have the existing driveway, and I don't know if any of you drove by the yes. site or looked at it, but the terrain is actually rather rolling. There's a fair amount of bedrock projecting here, as well as adding the addition to the north side of the building would require rerouting the driveway and access to the existing garage. So we feel like that's actually a larger impact on both the land and in terms of, thank you, in terms of the proximity of the proposed addition to nearby neighbors, um, there's actually a neighbor's house right up the hill on this side looking down on the property, whereas the neighbor on this side is kind of farther below and there's less impact looking up the hill. So, so the main reason for putting it on the southern end is really the site constraint of the driveway, but also we feel the impact will be less. How close is the neighbor um, below? The neighbor below, I would estimate their house to be maybe about 200 feet. I think in my application, um, I had indicated that the nearest neighbor to the um, addition was approximately 200 feet to the buildings. And um, let's see. So basically, I just wanted to offer the zoning conformance worksheet to illustrate that really every other item of the code, we are, are well within the guidelines. And really, because of the position of the existing building on the lot, um, we feel that you know, the, the necessity of the side yard is minimal, given that all of our other zoning requirements are met well within the guidelines. Um, then, show, um, the variance you're seeking is in feet what? The variance you're seeking? 19 feet you're seeking to 19 the feet. side yard, correct. The, the side 30, yard right? requirement is 30, and we're asking for 19 feet. And in addition, Anne and David actually reached out to their neighbors um, and showed them the plans for the addition. And we do have a couple of informal emails um, from their neighbors in support of the addition. Um, and actually, there, the three letters that you have there are one from the neighbor to the south, one to the north, and one to the side. So really the ones that are most closely impacted by the addition. Uh, let's see. From different people, I guess, right? Three, three different people? Oh, we should all have a copy. Yeah, there's only, there's only one copy. Thank you. Yeah, are there any other neighbors um, in the area uh, where the addition is being proposed so to the actually to this side is okay. sure okay okay, so we can hear. okay. thank you um, uh, well, let, let me just let me just take a look at these very quickly uh let's see it's from uh joanne kenna i guess who's uh she a neighbor She's the one to the south. Okay. Is that the closest neighbor? Yes. Uh, we'd love to get together to see your plans. We're excited is for your vision of your house. Okay. I guess you got together with me and you showed them, and I, I showed them the, the plans and like that, and she said that uh, they have no no objections. Uh, we, we did, we did uh, meet with them, showed them the plans they approved, and yeah. Okay. You applied them with dinner, huh? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Next one. Next one is. I, I, I'm tired. I'm just joking. That's okay. Next one is is Paul. Paul Mooney. Well, that's good. We got Paul Mooney. Uh, he's what? We, we, he's north. Okay. And he says that you have the full support. Okay. And Debbie Milner. She says no problems. Good luck. So you got. Sounds like you have a lot of good neighbors. And also, uh, I noticed that you're only building one story. <laughs> Correct. Okay, go ahead. 
Uh, so yeah, in keeping with what you were asking, the addition we're proposing actually is at the ground floor level, and because the terrain drops off a little bit from the house, we feel like the impact of this addition is even less. From the road, because of the terrain, it will be hardly visible, and um, we've actually dropped the, the roof line by a foot to um, just keep the height as low as possible, and so... We hope that you'll find that our request is minimal and will not have a negative impact on our neighbors and we'll grant our approval. Thank you. Is there anybody in the audience who'd like to speak to, <laughs> to this? And there's nobody in the audience. Well, I have to ask, even though there's nobody there. You never know. Somebody might jump out of the corner there. At this point, I'd like to make a motion we close the public hearing. I just want to ask one question. Sure. sure. What would you do if we denied you? Um, I asked that of everybody, so it right. doesn't yeah. mean anything. Yeah. I'm going to vote um, To yeah. be honest, it it would be a challenge. We probably would not be able to build the addition. Um, I, for the reasons that I've already explained, but also from a cost of construction standpoint, and I know that doesn't really factor into what you're considering, but um, but we do feel it would be impossible to achieve what we want to do without the variance. Um, mainly given the site constraints. And we also feel like if, yes, we could build the addition on the north without a variance, as you asked. Um, however, could it would. interject something here? Uh, our wellhead is to the north of the house. So that would really, yeah. Right, the well. The well. All right, well, you have to step up. You're going to have to step the, up. The wellhead. The wellhead is to the north of the house. Sure, yeah. Well, here's the well, right? The well is to the north. Um, okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. Speak to the microphone. And you are? Uh, I'm David Provan, one of, one of the owners. Um, and the wellhead, the, the driveway is here, and the wellhead is to the north right there. So okay. it's that, that ruled that out for us, yeah. All right. Now your wife wants to speak. Yeah, wife See what you started? So, Always correct. Well, um, <laughs> the Moonies, the Moonies uh, live over here. Let's see, where, is, where are they? They're, right. they're over here. They and do. they look towards Jay Cox Pond. Right. So if we build a building there or extend our house, it, it, it won't be nice for them. Right. Okay. Whereas the, the Kennas over here, their whole house is oriented to the pond. And it's the back and their driveway which faces our house. Right. So when we put that addition on, the, the actual impact is that we will not be able to see them in their pool. <laughs> so they can, you know, feel more comfortable. And then there's a cliff that goes down. I see it. I see it. I so the cliff, you know, they, don't, they really won't see uh, the addition, I don't think. Okay. Thank you. That was thoughtful of you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just like like All right, and I'll second. second. All in favor, close. Aye. 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 All right, this time I just want to go over the five factors. Make a session. Uh, factor, uh, first factor. What possible detriment would the variance have on nearby properties? I well, say very little. None. The nearest structure is probably 200 feet away, and uh, for all the neighbors. I think it's a great idea, so I don't have any problem there. Uh, what impacts would the variance have on a character neighborhood? Uh, proposed variance would have no negative impacts on a character neighborhood. Nearby structures are a similar scale and height and size. If you didn't get the variance, what else could you build? And what do you want to accomplish your goal? Due to existing site constraints. When we spoke about that, I know that there's one big uh, ridge on the, on the end that can't be built on. Uh, how large your variance is seek? A variance we seek is uh, 19 foot, right? 19 foot variance is required. Okay, what impact or effect would the variance have on a current physical environmental conditions? I don't think there's any, any negative conditions on, uh, on that mm -hmm. environmental impact. Uh, and the variance requested is as a result of self-created hardship. Uh, no, because the way the property was developed by previous owners, the possible location for the proposed addition was limited. Uh, well, we can argue that one, but, uh, you know, at this point in time, I would call for a roll call vote uh, on granting the variance, 94 or 200 Jaycox Road. Mr. 
I vote to grant. Mr. Lim? I'll vote to grant. Mr. I Lim? vote to approve. Approve. I vote to grant it, too. And I vote to grant it, too. Okay, you're all set. <laughs> you have to wait for the attorney, though, to make the resolution. He, he, he makes the resolution, and then he, 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 he sends it to me, and I sign it, and then the building inspector will give you a building permit. And well, you're I'll, familiar. I'll take the brunch if you'll, you yeah. Know, if you want a really good I resolution. Sign it, so I want a brunch too. Do you want that? That's uh, that's what the mayor. Yeah, said. sure. I'll send it. Put it in a pile. All right. Uh, now. Motion to adjourn. Second. All, okay. All in favor? All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Good night. Good luck.